My name is Theo Spanos Dunphy, and I'm the president and executive director of Global Citizen Circle. For almost 50 years, our organization has been gathering together people of diverse backgrounds, ages, ethnicities, religions, and opinions to talk with and listen to one another. And in so doing, to stimulate constructive change around issues of pressing concern locally, nationally, and globally. Pre-pandemic, these conversations happened in person, in New Hampshire, in Boston, in Washington, DC, and in South Africa, Northern Ireland, and Cuba. While this past year and a half has been nothing we could have anticipated, nor would we have wished for, it has brought unexpected blessings. Connecting regularly with more people throughout the world has brought us closer during a time of distancing. A shared sense of purpose in fighting the pandemic, as well as racial injustice and inequity, and in building the world we want, has shown us how important it is to listen and learn from one another with open hearts and minds. More than ever, we see that there is a need for the kind of connection and empathy Global Citizen Circle strives to build. I'm so pleased to welcome you all to the circle. The idea to do this circle on critical race theory was prompted by a conversation with Pierre Morton, Chief Diversity Officer at Franklin Pierce University this past summer, when so many educators were looking to the next academic year with questions about what this critical race theory was all about and how its weaponization might impact their teaching. Since then, we've only heard more and more about CRT and laws being passed to stop the teaching of divisive issues. I wanna thank Pierre and Franklin Pierce University for supporting this important and timely discussion. And I'd like to thank our partners, Social Change Initiative and Southern New Hampshire University for their ongoing support of Global Citizen Circle. Today, we'll hear from our distinguished discussion leaders, Dr. Janet Duart Bell, a self-described layperson's perspective, and Professor Kendall Thomas, the views of a preeminent scholar of critical race theory. But before we do, I'm so happy to introduce to you our moderator today, Tammy Tai, the Deputy Director of King Boston, a nonprofit working to create a living memorial and programs honoring the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King and their time and work together in Boston. When we heard just a few weeks ago that all of the staff working at King Boston were studying critical race theory, we thought what a perfect opportunity to partner and invite Tammy to facilitate our discussion today. And we're so grateful she accepted. So before I turn over the virtual mic to Tammy and we hear from our discussion leaders, let me also say that we encourage interaction during and even after our programs. And if you have a question or comment, please type it into the chat. And once our discussion leaders have made their opening remarks, Tammy will call on you to unmute yourself, say your name and where you're from and ask your question. So with that, I'll turn things over to you, Tammy. Theo, thank you, thank you so much. I'm deeply honored to be in this space with you all, Tammy Ty, my pronouns are she, her, coming from the unceded land of the Massachusetts in um, Massachusetts, Boston. Um, so Theo, thank you and welcome everyone to this, um, this circle conversation on critical race theory. I've gotta say a global audience for this discussion is just really exciting. I'm looking at the numbers. 111 people in this space. So thank you for carving out the time um, to be here. And I've got to say, I'm really excited, but also a bit awestruck um, for today's conversation, because we've got two of our legends here to help us unpack critical race theory, to understand what's behind the root of this recent backlash and weaponization here in the United States. We know that has reverberations all around the world. And where we might find hope as we look to critical race theory for designing and living into the kind of world where we all thrive, grounded in real joy and well-being. So I'm just gonna invite everyone to join me in welcoming um, Dr. Janet Dwart Bell and Professor Kendall Thomas. If you haven't found your reactions buttons yet in Zoom, send them a heart or a clap or like some confetti. Um, I think this looks like a beautiful image on, on the screen there. Um, but uh, allow me to just introduce them and then we're getting to get into conversation. So 
Dr. Bell um, is a social justice advocate, author, and dare I say Dr. Bell, an all-around diva. Uh, she's the founder and president of Lead Intergenerational Solutions. She's the host of the forthcoming podcast, Leading Justice, coming out this November, and founder of the Derek Bell Lecture on Race in American Society at New York um, University School of Law, now in its 26th year. Professor Thomas is Nash Professor of Law at Columbia Law School, a teacher, scholar, activist, and artist. His seminal writing on an intersection of race and law appears in Critical Race Theory, the key writings that founded the movement, which he also co-edited. If you don't have it, here is the shameless plug um, to get the book. Um, so I'd love to just welcome you both and just to hear your voice and welcome you into the circle. I wonder if both of you just unmute and just say hello. And I, I'd love to ask a question to help folks just to hear what's going on with you right in this moment. I'd love to hear from both of you, what's bringing you joy today? So Dr. Bell, maybe you just say a hello and what's bringing you joy today? And then Professor Thomas will go to you. This gathering I put in the chat, it's light and love and uh, the energy is just, is just amazing and the warmth. I love the Global Citizen Circle. That brings me joy. Thank you so much. And I hope you're seeing all these like claps and dances um, in the chat for you. Uh, Professor Thomas, welcome you into the space to say hello and what's bringing you joy today? Well, like Janet, I'm delighted to be here this morning and I'm particularly grateful for the opportunity to meet and be part of uh, a learning community about which uh, I knew very little before Janet called me a couple of months ago now to ask me if I would be willing to participate in a gathering of the Global Citizen Circle. So my life work as an educator really is to promote uh, and participate in as broad a, uh, a learning community as I can. And I'm particularly moved by the fact that this is a community that has global ambitions and a global reach, because I do think uh, that the hope for uh, a future on this planet is going to require us to realize that our fates are linked and our futures are linked uh, in ways that overrun the national borders that so often divide us. Um, Ashe, Professor Thomas, thank you for that. Um, so we're gonna begin our circle with um, Dr. Bell and I understand you've got a presentation that you're gonna start off the conversation with and I'll just invite everyone as Theo um, said at the beginning, be thinking about all your questions. I imagine the questions will come and I'm doing my best with the support of the Global Citizen Circle team to track those questions, but we want to get as many voices um, in here for conversation as possible. So, Dr. Bell, I will pass uh, the virtual mic to you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the kind introduction, both you and, and Theo, and it's always wonderful to be with the Global Citizen Circle. I want to start off by saying, as, as you might have already guessed, I'm not a lawyer, and I do not play one on TV. But I have been drawn into this conversation about critical race theory because of my association with, and I can say it, the great Derek Bell. And um, I've decided that I really need to, needed to develop a layperson's description of it because I've been asked so often. Most of the time when people would call me about people who are experts, I relied on the people who literally wrote the book like Kendall Thomas, and I would refer them to him and to others. But I think there's a place for us and part of our civil discourse is really to be comfortable with talking about this idea. So my, my presentation is about is, is, is about 10 minutes or so. So bear with me on uh, with that. And I want to say also one word about uh, Kendall Thomas, although one word is never enough about Kendall Thomas. We have a love fest. We, um, he is, as close to the Bell family as you can get. And uh, he has been a, so, such a supporter of Derek and of mine. I said in a, in a private meeting, which I'll say publicly, I've probably not said it for Kendall, for Professor Kendall Thomas to hear it, but he was the last of our friends to see Derek's corporal body. He was with me in the hospital when, when my husband transitioned. You can't get much closer than that. And, um, 
I just want to thank Kendall for joining in this conversation today. And I want to tell you what a wonderful treat it is for you to be able to meet him. I, I call him a true Renaissance man, a true global citizen. So I want to start with, I have, I, so I've reduced it to four basic concepts and they're based on values, not legal theory. So the first is defending democracy through truth and reconciliation. Um, the next slide, please. And when you, so these are, the, these are the four concepts here. So I'll just read through them. Defending democracy through truth and reconciliation, history and facts matter. Confronting the big lies and orchestrated false racial fears and taking responsibility and moving forward as a nation. So let me unpack that. So first I'll talk a little bit about defending democracy through truth and reconciliation. And we have a great examples from South Africa where, uh, where the great leaders, um, Desmond Tutu and others said, you know, that they, 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 they didn't let black Africans off the hook. They said, if we're going to go, if we're going to move forward together, you know, we've got to tell the truth. Hmm, that's a novel idea these days. So that's what they endeavored to do. We also have uh, talking about, there, there are other examples where people really have, have fought to be heard, to have their voices heard and to reach across the, the differences that they, the perceived differences, because oftentimes there are differences that, that, that people imagine. So we have Northern Ireland, we have we have a lot of examples. We have the American freedom struggle movement in the South where people had to reach across differences. And unfortunately, still we're still fighting that fight. And in fact, if you saw the special the other day on the Civil War, we're still fighting the Civil War, which is one of the wars in which the losers actually endeavored to and wrote the narrative. So we're living with that narrative from the Civil War, from the rebels who po who then uh, who, who built monuments to people who fought against the union. And we see that happening now. We're looking at, we're looking at the history of race in America being played out right now, where people are denying what's happening. Uh, January 6th is a flashpoint. But if you look at all these things where at, during the Obama administration, where people uh, where uh, his appointments were denied. And there, there's studies that say when you, when you talk how people, even though Obama was probably the most uh, conciliatory person, they called him the bridge. And if you, if you call healthcare, Obamacare, some people go, oh, no, no, we don't want it. But if you called it the you know, American Care Act or something like that, they would be more inclined to accept it. That was then, now with people being anti-vax, I'm not too sure some of, some of them would accept it, accept it now. So we have an, a moral imperative to look at history and facts. If we don't do that, we are not only doomed to repeat some history and we will not, we will not be able to move forward. There's a great movie that was done at I believe in uh, in the 1970s called the garden of the fancy contini's where there's a, a very rich jewish family in uh, mussolini's italy just thought well this isn't good this cannot affect me this is not happening to me this is around me we can play tennis we can do whatever we want to do but you know we are immune from things that affect other people and of course that's until you get as many of us have found that knock on the door and you realize that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And we must really embrace the fact that we, we cannot be fact free. There is no such thing as alternative facts. History is one of uh, explanation. Sometimes it's a distortion, but some of us are able to distinguish between what is uh, what is real and what is false, although it seems less so sometimes. I'm, 
I'm amazed that, for example, in Tulsa, and if I get any of the legal things wrong, I'm counting on my dear friend Kendall to, to straighten it out when he speaks. But it's interesting that they want to, that they feel you can talk about the Tulsa, what we call riots, were really a slaughters and the, mostly slaughters of black citizens here because for some reason people had built up this um, this narrative, this false narrative of um, that it that black people were a danger to society. It was okay when we could build this country, but once we once we started becoming successful against all the odds, many of these riots were really attacks on black progress, and that was the case on uh, uh, Black Wall Street in Tulsa. So there are many examples of that. So we're looking and we're seeing racism in real time. So how do we confront that? We have to deal uh, directly with people. We have a grievance culture now. People feel that they have the right to be aggrieved for whatever reason it is to throw facts out the window, to be discourteous, to be dishonest, that the only thing that counts is winning. Winning is the only thing, no matter how you get there and no matter how detrimental it is to those people who think they are winning. Those who deny um, voting to others, those who deny, who are in denial about climate change. Climate change affects us all. There's no planet, there's no earth too. We are literally all in this together. So how do we confront those fears? The biggest thing is to tell the truth and to be as positive, positive and authentic as we can. And Theo mentioned hope. I am always hopeful because I believe, as Brian Stevenson says, that hopelessness is the enemy of social justice. And I wake up every day, I thank the Lord for the world that has been made, and I try to do my best to preserve it and to honor and preserve the people in it. One thing about the, when we talk about um, how do we confront the big lies, we have to realize that Americans for some reason are an unhappy bunch. You know, we're all, we all can't move to Iceland now. So we have to figure out how we, how we, educate people to know without blaming them, because I believe that most people are good. In fact, it's probably uh, their figures that go from 20 to 30% of the people who are the ones who are, have, are entrenched in terms of um, um, this grievance mentality and those who might overthrow um, legally elected governments and things like that, the insurrectionists. That's a small group. As my mother, the philosopher, the late Willie May Neal would say, sometimes the lunatics run the asylum. And what we have to do is take it, take it back. We have to recapture the people who testified yesterday in the United States. And I know this is a global audience who taught these election officials who talked about how the threats on their lives for just doing their jobs and their job writ large is really protecting the democracy. If we do not have the right to vote, we have lost the game. That's where it is. I, I suggest to people that we have to watch our language because we sometimes adopt language without thinking that really helps perpetuate the negativity. So we so if we say that ra critical race theory is a divisive issue, I don't say that. Critical race theory is a theory of enlightenment. It's a theory of love. It's a theory of how we talk together, how we embrace our joint history with a clear eye an open heart and a clear mind. That's what I think critical race theory is. So we have to really look at the language that we use and we need to take responsibility if we want to move forward. I love the title of today's, um, today's Global Citizen Circle. I was thinking about it. I didn't come up with the title, but I love it. It says critical race theory facing our history freeing our future. And I thought we could actually flip that and it would still be the same. It would show a different aspect of it. Freeing our history, facing our future. By freeing our history, what we do, we look at such things as 
what impact slavery has had. There's, there's now a black group that, that is now trying to counter the teachings of the 1619 Project. So you'll always have people who are not doing the right thing. I want to end with a couple, couple quotes, one from one of my favorite rabbis, Rab, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who walked with Dr. Martin Luther King. And uh, someone was challenging him for his activism. And, and aren't, you, aren't you a person who's supposed to be in this um, uh, theoretical ivory tower, just espousing these sort of theories and that? Aren't you supposed to be leading us in prayer? And Rabbi said, I'm praying with my feet. And that's what we have to do. We have to pray with our feet sometimes, and we have to embrace the fact that we may not all get there at the same time, but we have to get there and we have to have faith and hope that that is going to be the case. And I end with hope. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bell, th th thank you for that. And you know, as you say, this layperson's view of critical race theory. Um, Professor Thompson, I wanna invite you into the conversation and see first if you'd wanna add anything to what Dr. Bell has shared around CRT, from particularly a legal perspective. Now we're not all lawyers, but there are particular tenets of CRT that maybe we wanna uplift here. Um, and then as you're doing that, maybe talk about the ways CRT has been misrepresented or weaponized in recent times and why you think that is. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Janet. I can build on what Janet has just said by simply noting again that critical race theory emerged from law schools. Critical race theory was and remains an effort to describe and explain a legal failure, the failure of US law to make good on the constitutional promise of full democratic citizenship for people of color in the United States. So I want to center that as the project of critical race theory, because by remarking its institutional location in law schools, I can highlight the ways in which critical race theory is concerned, and centrally so, about teaching and supporting a culture of racial literacy in the United States. And that connects to the question you just raised about the misrepresentation of CRT. Now, I think that the misrepresentation of CRT or what its opponents are calling CRT is not a mistake. It's a deliberate tactic that's connected to a larger strategy of weaponization. And what's being weaponized is not critical race theory, since the attackers uh, of critical race theory actually have very little knowledge and no interest at all in critical race theory. What's being weaponized is illiteracy. Some of you may remember the remarks of then presidential candidate Donald Trump after the Nevada Republican primary in which he thanked his various uh, constituencies and said at one point, I love the poorly educated. So I want to submit to you that the entire platform of the Republican Party can be understood through the lens of that statement and Donald Trump's professed love, which in fact was thinly veiled contempt uh, for the poorly educated. Because the right-wing attack on critical race theory has weaponized this country's epidemic of racial illiteracy, right? uh, but also this country's epidemic of functional or basic illiteracy. And I'm talking here quite, quite simply about the inability of large numbers of Americans to read and write. So just some facts, according to the website Planet Word, 32 million American adults cannot read. 
and 34% of fourth graders were unable to read at a basic level on national tests in 2019. According to the Department of Education, the U.S. Department of Education, 54% of adults in the United States can't read and write at a sixth grade level. And 50% of Americans can't read a book written at an eighth grade level. So by the time they reach eighth grade, 66% of American kids can't read on grade level. And every year, one in six Americans drop out of school. Now, three of every five Americans who are in this country's prisons cannot read. And 85%, let me just say that again, 85% of young people who come into the criminal punishment system, into the prison industrial complex, or what we call, uh, rightly, the school to prison pipeline, are functionally illiterate. 70% of people in US prisons can't read at a fourth grade level and 48% of incarcerated people in this country are functionally illiterate. Forbes magazine uh, estimates that the low literacy levels among US adults could be costing the economy $2.2 trillion a year. And so the crisis of democracy uh, that we are living in real time in the United States is closely connected, in my view, to the crisis of illiteracy. Right? And we have to understand the Republican Party's weaponization of illiteracy in that light. It's part of a broader project and a raft of laws and policies that aim to purge public education and our public institutions of any ability to talk in a thoughtful way about race and racial power in the United States. So this is a political project which is weaponizing our literacy about race and our functional illiteracy and our civic illiteracy to destroy the very foundations of the democratic idea, which has always been an imperfect idea in the United States. So I think we need to understand on one side, the connection between democracy and literacy, between democracy and literacy on one hand and between fascism and illiteracy on the other. And let me just say, if we care about the future of democratic citizenship, not just in the United States, but globally, we have to be willing to use uh, the word fascism. It's not a dirty word. Uh, and it connects what is going on in our present uh, to a long history of attacks on the possibility of democracy, multiracial and otherwise. So I, I, wanna, I wanna say that as an educator, uh, critical race theory for me is first and foremost about creating the conditions of possibility for defending and enlarging the culture of civic literacy. Professor Thomas, thank you for that. And I'm I, I'm going to ask one question as I invite others, as you're hearing these two like brilliant, full presentations, um, reflections to put your questions in the chat. And um, we've also been overloading you with resources in the chat. So there is books and articles. Uh, most recently, the New Yorker had a, a piece on the origins of CRT and then related books that speak to some of what Professor Thomas was just listing up, particularly this um, notion of debunking the zero-sum game thinking. So there's a link to Heather McGee's The Sum of Us that I would really encourage folks to, to read and, and study and, and use that in your, uh, in your advocacy work. Um, but uh, Professor Thomas and Dr. Bell, one question I'd love to have you both talk on, because I think um, 
Professor Thomas, you did just a beautiful job of connecting or the ways that CRT has been weaponized uh, with groups with whom have a, actually a vested interest in understanding that history, right? Because that history of our, our structural racism, of racism is it, not just impacting a small slice of the population, it's actually impacting all of us, right? And so the inability to understand that and to incorporate that and then to be turned against it um, I think has been actually brilliant on the part of those who are against what we're talking about here. Um, but with one of the notions of CRT, one of the tenets around interest convergence, right? Trying to understand where those who have power or trying to hold on to power may need to cede to bring about something different with those who are on the margins um, and, and trying to find that, again, that point of interest convergence. What, what's your answer to how we bring along those who are both illiterate in the way Professor Thomas have you outlined, like just basically illiterate, much less racially and civically illiterate to understand that their needs and interests are served um, in this truth telling process. So I, I put that out as a first question for both of you to engage with as I'm checking in the chat here um, to bring others into the circle. Janet, would you like to go first? Well, I was, I was thinking here, you, first of all, those powerful words that you said, and I like you talking about the uh, you know, racial literacy and what have you. And I was thinking about, I uh, just wanted to raise one thing before addressing your question uh, directly. And that is the prop, Cheryl Harris, another uh, critical race theorist, who's written about the property uh, right in whiteness. And what this country has done in terms of systemic racism is that we have built, to build white supremacy, uh, you have to um, say that there's something different about and something special about to privilege white folks. So as people, as, as immigrants have come to the United States and they were considered less than white, uh, and then they became white. White was the standard by which people were uh, people were trying to obtain. And so that has been a part of the history too. And it's hard for people to get away to get away from that. I think in terms of interest convergence, to me, it is it's it's right in front of us when we talk about the the basic tenets of our democracy. We are under attack. Um, uh, er Adam Schiff's book, uh, Midnight in Washington, where he says that uh, we we might, you talked about January 6th, the, the insurrection, where we might lose it. People don't seem to understand that if they can take rights away, if one person can, let's say, disenfranchise or overturn the, the election of a, um, of a congressional district or a, a statewide district, they their power really goes beyond that. What you've done is you've given the devil more than the devil is due. You've given the devil power to control your lives. We see it. Uh, Texas is one um, example of that, how once once people give up the people power and, and do not speak and do not speak up, and that's what democracy is. Democracy is not a spectator sport. If we want to have an active uh, democracy, we have to be involved in it, and we have to preserve it, or at least we've got to, we've got to support it. We cannot stand by idly. You know, there's some people who say, um, you know, I'm not in, I'm not into politics. I want to say, well, sweetheart, your life is really run by politics, and that's something that we have, we have to look at, and so we have to say it in a way that that brings people in. And I tell people that. You know, we we don't have a lot of time left on this if we want to save our democracy. When the more we know about about what happened between October 2020 and what happened um, and is happening now, the more we should be concerned that if we want a functioning democracy where it is not a plutocracy, where it where that where um, we are bound to the whims, wishes, perversion of a few, we have got to act. And it's got to be, and I'm speaking in language before the Global Citizen Circle, when I speak to 
other with a different audience, I try to make, bring, break it down just a little bit more. So I hope that 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 answers part of your question. Let me just pick up on what Janet has said um, about this notion of of whiteness as property. Um, I think it's fair to say, as the critical race theorist Barbara Flagg has insightfully noted, that at least in the United States and perhaps elsewhere, one of the things that defines white racial identity is the fact that most white people, most of the time, in most places as they navigate daily life and their relationships in the public and private sphere, rarely, if ever, have to think about the fact that they're white. Right? Uh, and Barbara Flagg calls that the phenomenon of white racial transparency. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's the, the way of looking at the world uh, that stands behind the statement, for example, um, I don't see color or people are just people. Right? And it takes as its baseline uh, the experience that most white people have of not thinking about the fact that they're white. Now, one of the things that uh, we have seen in the last 10 years, or even more really, because it was part of the birther project uh, of which Donald Trump was the public face during the Trump administration, is the cobbling together of a white racial identity politics and the marrying of the cultural politics of white racial identity, which is very different than the phenomenon of white uh, racial transparency, the marrying of a cultural politics of white racial identity to an electoral politics of authoritarian populism, right? at whose heart is a commitment to strong man illiberal democracy. So this monocultural, ethno-racial, right, illiberal democratic vision has emerged as a way to address and organize the imagination of American citizens, right? The great black uh, cultural theorist, Stuart Hall, writing after the election of the Tory party and Margaret Thatcher to a third term in office, uh, reminded people in England that the way people imagine themselves is at the very heart of politics. And uh, liberals and progressives and leftists, I'll just use those terms interchangeably, uh, think that politics is about ideas and making the better argument and policies and interests. But Hall pointed out that uh, what Margaret Thatcher had been able to do, and this is what the Republican Party is so clearly trying to do, what Margaret Thatcher and the Tories had been able to do in England was to cobble together what he called a symbolic majority, right? It wasn't the actual majority of Americans, but it was a symbolic majority of people who were united by identity and the way they imagined themselves. And the, the irony or the paradox is that this is a politics uh, which in fact has weaponized whiteness against white people, right? Uh, to blind them to the ways in which the struggle against racism and for racial justice is um, an indispensable ingredient of a future in which they would receive the social and economic justice uh, that is consigning so many Americans who are white uh, to quite literally to death. Uh, some of you may have read 
the extraordinary book by Anne Case and Angus Deaton called Deaths of Despair and the Future of Capitalism, uh, in which they point out uh, a number of really sobering facts about the white working class. So white men without a college degree experienced uh, an average growth in median wages between 1979 and 2017 that was negative, minus 0.2% a year, even as median hourly wages for all white workers grew by 11% um, in the same period. Moreover, um, deaths from suicide, drug overdoses, and alcohol-related disease among middle-aged white men and women skyrocketed from 30 per 100,000 in 1990 to 92 per 100,000 in 2017. And the spike in these deaths was almost exclusively confined to white Americans, both men and women without a college degree. Donald Trump's poorly educated. Right? Uh, mortality rates among college-educated Americans have continued uh, to fall, and mortality rates for white working-class people in other wealthy countries are similarly in decline. Right? So the story of uh, whiteness, a phrase I, I hesitate to use because it, it's, it's um, frustratingly imprecise, and uh, lends itself to misunderstanding, right? So I wanna talk about this idea of um, whiteness as property. Basically, white working class Americans are coming to realize what Martin Luther King uh, in the 60s said black folk had come to realize. Basically, they were holding a blank check, right? Uh, and so the racial capital, the symbolic capital of being white for large segments of the US population really is dead capital, right? Uh, it quite literally uh, means a destiny in this country whose destination is death. And so I think in fact, if we're talking about um, how to begin the hard cultural and political work of creating a multiracial solidarity among American citizens that understands the connection between racial justice and economic justice, we have to start by acknowledging in ways that we are not always willing to do white working class suffering, right? And the ways in which um, whiteness and white identity politics has become, in the words of one theologian writing about capitalism actually, um, an ideological weapon of death. Now, this is not particularly sunny or hopeful language, uh, but one of the things that I learned from Derek Bell was my responsibility as an intellectual who thinks about race, be a realist, right? And so racial realism at this moment in our history requires me to note uh, that we cannot understand that we have to understand the connection between black precarity and black privation, right? Um, whether we're talking about COVID uh, and healthcare more generally, whether we're talking about homelessness, whether we're talking about the poor state of schools uh, in black and brown communities and white precarity and white privation among the white working class. We don't really like to talk about class in this country, right? um, but I think we need a mixed uh, analysis and a mixed 
practical program right, uh, of an imaginal politics, of a politics that interrupts the ways in which the right wing has gotten people to imagine themselves, that really brings the question of uh, class into the national conversation uh, and allows us to talk about actually existing racial capitalism in the United States as a capitalism whose predations um, and whose um, inequalities and inequities may be more visible among people of color, but which have targeted uh, and are quite literally um, engaged in uh, a murderous politics among white people, right? So I think we have, um, I, I don't see any more urgent task, right, at this moment. Uh, than that. Uh, thank you both, because I think in both your answers, you're weaving in all these other tenets for folks to understand around CRT, this notion of intersectionality, Professor Thomas, that you're speaking to right there in that those closing statements, but also the importance of, and you know, I started off by talking about how we can ground CRT to imagine this new world, right? So the power of imagination and belief, right, that are sort of the right wing in this country has done, I will say, a beautiful job of having people buy into a particular narrative and understanding of, of who they are, whether it's quote unquote truth or true or not. Um, and the grounding in CRT of the importance of the, both the storytelling counter narrative to help imagine something different. And right. that that is our, that when we think about there's, a, there, we're gonna get to the questions now because there's questions about like, how do we counter but this, um, this cultural exercise, if you will, around imagination, um, I think is exactly what we are, what we're needing to do um, in this moment in time. Um, okay, I've got to open up the circle to the 130 folks in here. We've got at least four questions. Um, and let me, uh, Carrie Larkin, I'll, I'll invite you. You had the first question and see if you'd uh, still like to pose it here. Why don't you open your mic and come on into the space? Thank you. I'd be grateful to ask my question. Um, this is, I share the warmth and the intellectual energy of the circle this morning. My first circle, I was in high school and I am way far from high school now. I, I taught high school for many years and taught critical race theory and benefited so much from its teaching. And what I'm grappling with, what I find myself grappling with as a white woman is how to speak up in spaces that do not feel like this, how to speak up in defense and protection of what we on this call believe in, in spaces that do not feel this warm and welcome. And so I would, I would ask the two doctors, um, what, what would be our, not so much our personal steps of courage and bravery, um, but like the talking points and the way to enter into and facilitate a conversation with, um, particularly white people who are protecting their white identity as opposed to um, not even seeing it as an identity. Mm. And thank you for the opportunity to ask. Well, I think that there's so many variations and uh, uh, subtleties with how people approach this the whiteness and they and people who think that they are so above above that white people who 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 really believe passionately that they are not racist and are not used and have not bought into a system of white supremacy. And so it, it really is how being sensitive to that area. But one of the things that I've been working on, and this is not, at, and I will be working on it forever, it seems, but it's uh, to tell when, when people are speaking in ways that I want to, um, uh, I feel that I need to have an interruption, a cultural interruption, mm -hmm. shall we say. Um, and I've learned to be much more civil. Thank you, Global Citizen Circle, uh, in, in, in doing that. Um, but I, I start with, well, I, and I say this because it's true. I understand that you are, that you have concerns and that you are angry or dissatisfied or something. And you probably have the right to be, uh, 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 
have some sort of upset, but you're angry at the wrong thing. You're angry mm -hmm. at the wrong people. You have you have now transferred that to people who are as um, who are vulnerable and who you should be working to uplift. So sometimes I tell people it's you have to think outside of yourself. One thing about our grievance society right now where we where people feel that they have the right to be so that they have a right to be aggrieved and they and that that, that their position uh, is um, uh, you know is it's immutable is is to say really it's uh, I have a friend who says to me before I have to give a major talk or something he said remember it's not about you. Mm -hmm. It's about yeah. it's about speaking the truth. It's 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 about listening to people and challenging them in a way. And sometimes and sometimes people look the other way and they walk they walk away. But the other thing that Derek Bell said was speak the truth. Try to speak it as kindly, and uh, but speak the truth because none of us will get further if we if we keep um, uh, pretending that certain things don't exist. And I, th I think that as I, I tell I tell white people, I said, you know, and black people, is, I guess similarly, is that just speak up. The more you do it, mm -hmm. the more you'll find a way to do it that's comfortable for you. And that's and that's very important. It's it's the you you'll find a, a narrative la and language that you find that you find uh, uh, effective. And so that's that to me is something something to is something to do, but don't be shy from it. You know, some I have a couple of friends who think that only black people should talk about black people, and I go like, yeah. what? Mm -hmm. No, that makes yeah. no sense whatsoever to me. And this whole thing that I think is talk about being weaponized, this whole discussion about cultural appropriation, they get upset that that somebody says uses y'all because they think that's a black southern thing. Well, I don't get upset with that. I think that's 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 a distortion of the idea of cultural appropriation. And so I think that the that we all just have to uh, be open to the fact one that we are trying we're trying to always deal with the subject in in as effective a way and as in, in humane and civil a way as we can. Although sometimes it, re it requires us to say, "Look, I'm just not going there. It's just it's just something I don't believe. You can't you can't." You cannot use that. That language is totally inappropriate, and you know what the kind of kind of language that I'm talking about. And so, it's 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 a series. It's a it's a series of becoming, but don't be shy about it. I'm sure that whatever you do is correct. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Bell and, and Professor Thomas. Before you lean in on that question, I'm actually going to invite C. Spares. That's the name I'm seeing because I think you have a. Another angle on this question about confronting, but particularly related to um, legislation. So um, if you'd like to come off your mic and speak your question to the space, C. Spears. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, yes, yes, Chauncey Spears, actually, and C. Spears is, is what I put on there. I just want to thank you for the space and this time. Uh, just, just to piggyback on uh, uh, what was been said about the issue of racial literacy. I think that the, my question speaks to that because what we find is that um, the people who are opposing, uh, who, are, who are weaponizing critical race theory in our states uh, are not really, you know, opposing critical race theory. What they're opposing is any kind of intellectual or critical conversation around the impacts of race and racism throughout the history of our country and trying to limit that kind of conversation in our public school systems. You know, given the fact that these people are indeed, for lack of a better term, racially illiterate, how can we effectively, you know, counter this in our states to protect, you know, the intellectual discourse that's taking place in our public school classrooms, K through 16 and beyond? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll jump in. I think Janet uh, was right on the money when she said that in, in conversations, we have to lead uh, with an argument about the ways in which uh, the anger and uh, the rage, it's not just anger, it's rage, uh, which is erupted, as you all know, uh, in, in violence uh, throughout this country, uh, is um, misdirected. Right? 
Uh, and so it's important, I think, to point out to people that the attack on critical race theory uh, and uh, the kind of panic politics uh, mm. that we've seen in school boards across the country and in school districts around the country is an effort to distract and divert attention from the massive upward distribution of wealth which has been taking place in this country for many, many, many years now. So um, I have done a fair amount of talking to the media uh, since this whole debate around critical theory, uh, critical race theory erupted, uh, including for New Hampshire Public Radio. And I try always to uh, recall the fact that the Georgia Department of Education passed a resolution attacking critical race theory in the same fiscal year that it was cutting by almost $1 billion the school budget, the public school budget, in the state of Georgia. Right? Uh, and so this culture war is, in my view, a smokescreen, mm -hmm. an alibi right, for the distributive injustices that are being visited upon Georgians of all races right, who rely on public education in that state, right? Um, and I think, in fact, what we need to do is to amplify a critique that is being made by very prominent figures on the right in this country. And that's the critique of racial capitalism, right? Um, Tucker Carlson, in January, I think it was last year, on one of his shows, went into a 15 minute diatribe about the way American capitalism is decimating families in this country and destroying the vibrancy of working class white communities. And he blamed both so-called small government conservatives and the bi-coastal liberal elites for ignoring the economic causes of the collapse of the working class that Ann Case and Angus Deaton talk about in uh, Deaths of Despair. Right. Uh, and he said that the, the cultural explanation that conservatives offer about the breakdown of the family ignores the ways in which the working class has been destroyed by the market fundamentalism of neoliberal capitalism, right? Uh, and the massive upward distribution of wealth through things like the 2017 tax reform, so-called, right? So these are uh, Tucker Carlson's words. The idea that families are being crushed by market forces seems never to occur to social conservatives. They refuse to consider it. And that's why I said earlier that unless and until we are willing in this country to talk about economic injustice and rapacious capitalism, right, we're going to, to see this repeated uh, weaponization of race as a way to divide and distract people who should form a natural democratic constituency, right? And that for me is the challenge. So, you know, um, in presidential debates, 
I think Ronald Reagan may have actually uh, invented this uh, rhetorical uh, question. Uh, we used to ask, are you better off right? <laughs> during presidential elections? Are you better off than you were four years ago? I mean, no white working class person honestly considering that question um, in the wake of you know, massive unemployment, the deindustrialization of the United States, the opioid ep ep epidemic, the rise in suicide and mortality rates, right? No white working class person can honestly answer that question, yes. And the Republican Party has a vested interest in not allowing them to ask themselves that question, right? So I think, you know, we sometimes think that it's small of us um, and um, amoral, right? Uh, to appeal to people's lived material realities, right? But that's the, that's the, the baseline and that's uh, the framework uh, from which people see the world, right? Uh, and I think we, we uh, undermine the possibility of progressive politics when we say, no, we're going to take this off the table. We're not going to talk about economic injustice. We're not going to talk about capitalism um, and the ways in which uh, actually existing capitalism uh, is a project of uh, immiseration and um, structural vulnerability right? for working class and poor people, whatever their color. Right? And unless and until we have the political courage to begin that conversation, uh, I would say, Carrie, in our interpersonal relationships with people that we know, right, who are living through these insecurities and say, um, what you're invited to see as a problem that has to do with race is in fact a problem that has to do with class, right? Uh, and you have more in common with working class and poor people of color, even the black middle class, uh, which is not a middle class in the same way that the white middle class is a middle class. You have more in common uh, with them uh, than you do with Donald Trump and uh, the the one percent uh, that Donald Trump represents and whose interests uh, he used his presidential administration uh, to preserve and protect. I don't really know why um, we shy away from those kinds of conversations, uh, but I think that race and racial antagonisms and the weaponization of race have a long history in this country uh, that has always been tied to preserving uh, the prerogatives of economic elites uh, and the wealthy, people who, who owe their economic security not to work, but to the wealth. Uh, that they've accrued. And, you know, I'm, I'm repeating myself at this point. Um, obviously, you can tell this is something about which I um, feel passionately, uh, but I think think as just as a practical political matter and as an intellectual matter, um, we need to have the courage of what we say our convictions around racial justice are and around uh, multiracial solidarity are and um, address the elephant in um, our common life, which is class and capitalism. And Professor Thomas, thank you for that. I mean, there's so much activity going on in the chat. This is a challenge as a moderator, sort of like how to, how but to I balance just, I just it. wanted to say one thing. Yeah, about, go ahead, Dr. Bell, of course. When you yeah. ask the question though, are you better off now than you were four years ago? I would suggest that a lot of poor white people would say, yes, they would totally ignore the economics of their situation because what they have bought into is the fact that that they have, that we are making America great again by come, this fantasy of, of uh, what a white nation would be for them. So they're willing to, and I've, and I've actually seen interviews where people are willing to 
quote, sacrifice. Remember the vote, Brexit vote. And uh, in Brexit, people were saying, oh, yes, you know, so I may be losing my harbor and my job here on the harbor, but I'm willing to sacrifice for, for what? You know, they bought into this, this image that is so uh, det detrimental. So I think that all the time that, 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 and people are afraid because as soon as you start talking in uh, some of the ways that Professor Thomas was saying, they immediately, immediately call you socialist. But if you use the F word, fascism, people get upset. What I'm encouraged about is that uh, news commentators now are, are talking more about fascism because they know we're in some ways the society is at 1159 and if we want to save it because they're talk about interest they're they're part of this society too that we have to talk about some of these things the the uh, structural racism the economy the i call it full frontal fascism that is going on right now and uh it's just uh there's we have so many issues that are that are intertwined but the basic issue is to talk about the the economics the identity of race where where we are the what is what what american image can we can we uh help promote and how, how can we help promote an american image an, an image of an american that's not dependent on white supremacy that is our challenge dr bell thank you so this is a nice lead into i'm going to try something here of inviting two people in to talk about their questions because i think it's related to uh, you all, the, 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 the talking about here, whiteness as property, white supremacy culture, which assumes there's something that is othered, right? There's, a, there's an othering here. So I actually want to invite, I'm going to invite Chris Walks to bring his question in around anti-Blackness and then L.W. Lee to bring your perspective in around it's not white or Black and it's, we've, got, we've got things in between to understand as well. So Chris, if you could do your question and then Ms. Lee, your question. And then I think that might be our last full question as we begin to move into the, the end of this session. So Chris Walks, if you're there. Sure, my apologies, everyone. My connection's a bit weak um, after the storm, um, but I'm trying to hang in there. Um, but my question is, um, it was related to that discussion earlier about the linkage between citizenship, literacy, um, and democracy. Mm. Um, and I find that to be such an important discussion because even if we're going to sort of think about historicizing critical race theory, but also Black people's learning, we have to think about the embattled grounds in which it started with, right, during the period of enslavement, um, during the transatlantic slave trade, in which the laws in many Southern states literally said it was a crime for Black people to learn, right? And so that as a sort of structuring antagonism of Black people's learning, um, but also to shape the confines of citizenship and democratic participation as well. Um, and so I always see this as sort of a long structuring antagonism of the Black experience, whether we're thinking about here or in England or in the Netherlands. And so I'm curious if either of you are able to speak to the specificity of anti-Blackness. Wow. Okay, and then Chris, we're gonna hold that question. And then Ms. Lee, let's bring your question in and see how we do addressing both together. Okay, um, so I'm Asian American um, and I just wanna point out the fact that racism in this country not... and that matter, uh, racism in the entire world is not just simply a Black and white issue. There are a lot of people, myself included, that do not identify myself as either black or white. And we play a role in this country, either, you know, I, I, am, I am closer to the white, uh, I am not black. And in that context, we play a role, a very strange role of both discriminating and being discriminated on. Um, I think all this conversation, both for this country as well as for the world, we should expand it to look at racism as something that should not exist, regardless of what is your color and who you identify, uh, who you identify with. Because if we don't do that, people who are neither black or white in this country would say, oh, that's not my issue. 
No, it is our issue. We are contributing to the racism in this country, knowingly or unknowingly. We need to bring all of these people into the conversation that it is our issue so that we expand the conversation and, and work towards a solution. And I'm, right. I'm appealing to the two doctors to see how we could really get people who do not necessarily identify themselves as either black or white to embrace this, to work towards solution rather than just sitting on the sideline and play one against the other. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So we're trying to address like where does anti-blackness fit in your perspectives and then how we understand the role of those who don't identify or not, who are not identified as black or white, right? Because that's also important here in the United States. It may not be what you identify as, but how you are also read. So who would like to try to go at that first? I think the two questions are connected. So I'll, 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 um, I'll try to address them. So I think the, the, the question of anti-Black racism or the specificity of anti-Black racism in the United States is an important one, uh, not least for historical reasons. Uh, and by that, I mean simply the ways in which race and racism as ideologies because that's what they are. Race is not a biological fact. There's no such thing, uh, biologically speaking, as a black person or a white person or an Asian person, right? Uh, these are social constructions. We make people up uh, using these ideas. Uh, and sometimes categories that aren't even about race in a biological sense uh, get put to work as part of what uh, Michael Omi and Howard Winnett call racialization. So we see, for example, uh, in the Middle East, the ways in which religion, right, being Muslim, gets constructed and put to use in ways that are remarkably similar to the ways in which uh, race gets operationalized here in the US. Uh, and the same is true for ethnicity. Two weeks before the 1954 decision in Brown versus the Board of Education, the Supreme Court decided a case called Hernandez versus Texas, which challenged the exclusion of Latinx people from service on grand and uh, trial juries. And in an extraordinary opinion, Chief Justice uh, um, Warren pointed out that the racism forbidden by the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution is not about identity, it's about attitudes and acts, how people are treated. And therefore, even though Mexican-Americans in the Texas community that was denying Mexican-Americans the right to serve on juries were deemed to be racially white, they could still be the targets of racism, right? Uh, and I think that is connected to uh, the challenge that L.W. Lee uh, invites us to take on of breaking out of the black-white binary, even as we realize that anti-black racism is foundational to all racisms, and as we realize that anti-black racism as it was developed in the United States did a long test run uh, in Europe itself, I uh, my last trip before the pandemic started was to Ireland, and I was struck at the ways in which the British colonial project in Ireland racialized Irish people, right? That's why we have a book called How the Irish Became White. So I think uh, this question of the interconnections or the articulation of race and ethnicity is crucial. In the UK, the anti-racist uh, coalition that was formed uh, among people of African descent and people of Asian descent led to a practice whereby progressive Asian people call themselves black. Why? Because they realized that black in that context was not about blood or hair texture or skin color. 
black was a political location, right? And so this solidarity among Asians and black people in the UK also has antecedents in the US. Frederick Douglass famously uh, was one of the few public figures in the United States uh, who opposed the exclusion of people of Chinese descent from citizenship, right? Um, and there are myriad instances from the 19th century uh, through the American Filipino Wars, through the concentration camps during World War II, to the collaborations between people like Grace Lee Boggs uh, and others with Malcolm X of um, solidarity between Asians and uh, Black Americans right here in the United States. I did a panel just last week with Professor Jennifer Lee of the Sociology Department called Linked Fates, Linked Futures on African-American and Asian-American relations. So I think it is critically important uh, that we see these issues both in the United States and globally um, across the so-called color line uh, and in ways that enlarge our vision, even as uh, we remain mindful of the ways in which anti-Black racism, for example, uh, goes some way toward explaining uh, why it is that new immigrants in particular uh, from Asia, and not just Asia, but from other parts of the United States, they may know that they're not white, but they certainly don't want to be black, right? Uh, and the construction of things like the model minority narrative, etc., are all part of a racial project uh, in which people are positioning themselves in relationship to the fundamental realities of anti-black racism in the United States and the ways in which, um, you know, um, uh, inequality and social exclusion have been over-identified, right? And over-distributed, if you will, among black Americans in ways that, you know, um, people in immigrant communities and Americans uh, uh, who of color who are not uh, black uh, are, are quite aware of, right? Are quite aware of. And, and that I think is going to be a real challenge, building coalitions across social differences that have been exploited uh, to create antagonisms among people of color, um, both ideological and political. Again, it has to do with the ways in which people imagine themselves. And so what we have here uh, is a failure of imagination uh, when we are unwilling or unable to see the linked fates uh, on which our linked future rests. Beautiful. Dr. Bell, we will give you the last words here as we start to move towards wrapping up our circle. Well, I think uh, Kendall Thomas really gave the last word. The only thing I would say is, is a short anecdote. I worked with someone years ago at the National Urban League who was, uh, who was Caribbean and bought into this concept. Uh, well, the way she stated it is that they were that uh, Caribbean um, black Caribbean people were better than black Americans because they were never enslaved. And I did what? I said you missed the sugar and uh, trade <laughs> and tobacco. I mean, I, it was it was astounding to me that someone could actually make that statement and be working for the National Urban League. And uh, but it was her the image she had of herself. And I was there during the time when people were trying to figure out what, what we would call ourselves. As, as a friend of mine said, we've been, uh, we've been uh, colored, we've been Negro, we've been black, we've been African-American, and we've been called a whole lot worse than that. Speaking of black folks, you know, and that goes with other people, uh, with other people of color. So what we have to do is what is really embrace all of our humanity. And that's a hard, none of this is easy. No one said it was going to be easy. But that is the hope that there are people who are talking about it, who know about it, and who are not willing to give up, who will continue to uh, walk in prayer, who will continue to walk in hope. So thank you for this opportunity to speak. And thank you for the privilege of sitting with you, Tammy, and with uh, Kendall Thomas. What an honor. Well, Dr. Bell, thank you. And you you answered the last question I was going to pose to both of you around hope. And so, Professor Thomas, I look to you 
Um, you've been talking deeply around, you know, the need for building these coalitions across social difference, the, the failure of imagination. Where else can we ground in for hope in this moment? Well, I, I personally believe that um, the arts and humanities are important sites for building uh, a culture of hope. Because uh, again, I'll mention um, Stuart Hall, the late great Stuart Hall, who famously said that we can say, and I would, I would offer a friendly amendment, we can say and do things in and through the arts that can't be said or done in any other way. Um, and I'll end with a personal anecdote. Um, Janet mentioned earlier that I was the last person to be with Derek in his mortal body. And what she didn't say was that during the five days before that, uh, Derek's hospital room became the site of an endless succession of a uh, procession of people singing and making music uh, because Derek wrote uh, an important book called Gospel Choirs. And I used to travel around with Derek. He would read from the book and I would sing. Uh, and what I was able to learn through that experience uh, was something that I forgot as a law professor. And that was um, that the basis of any contribution I can make to my students or to scholarship or to the public discourse has to be rooted in um, my exercise of my right and of my ethical obligation to live an integrated life. Mm. And so um, I would like to see us, uh, we've seen massive cuts in this country to an already woefully small uh, national budget dedicated to uh, the arts and humanities. But I was recently uh, at the New York premiere at the Metropolitan Opera of uh, Terence Blanchard's opera, Fire Shut Up in My Bones. And uh, I was overwhelmed uh, to really be witness to the ways in which that learning community, which had come to be entertained, uh, was transformed right? uh, by the experience of listening to this music and watching uh, this dramatized story in musical theater of the journalist Charles Blow. So I think that um, uh, my colleague Susan Sturm at uh, Columbia Law School works on a methodology that they've been calling theater of change, in which they take the arts and humanities into communities as a way to bring people into difficult conversations. So I would challenge the Global Citizen Circle uh, and each of you individually in the circles of which you are a part uh, to try to find opportunities to use music, poetry, uh, novels, right, uh, as a way to build uh, trust, because that's what we need. There is a trust deficit in this country. Uh, and then from there, uh, to begin having some of these hard conversations. So you see, we ended up in a place that has nothing to do with law. And for that, I am glad because, uh, and this will be my final word, uh, these issues I do not think can be solved principally by relying on the language of law and policy um, at all. Right, uh, because the problem, the soul sickness, as Derek would say, the soul sickness uh, that has brought us where we are is one that I think fundamentally has uh, to appeal to the common shared humanity uh, of us all. Is it possible uh, that you might sing something? <laughs> I knew Janet was going to do that. Well, why uh, should have been prepared? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, sure. Uh, here's a here's a little snippet of something. Um, um, we 
are gentle, angry people. And we are singing, singing for our lives. We are a gentle, angry people. And we are singing, singing for our lives. Ashe and Amen. Thank you both for pouring into all of us, into this global community today. Um, I, I am so moved and stirred. And there are all these comments thanking you for the hope and, and the, the words. I mean, I'm just really so moved. So I, I just uh, thank you both uh, for sharing your wisdom, your grace, um, and this space with us. Theo, I'll give it to you for any closing words. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I don't know how I can uh, thank all of you enough. Um, Tammy, for your, your mastery with moderating this conversation that has so much, so many more questions, so many more comments that could have come. Um, and, but I know people have to have to leave. And um, so we, but we want to continue these conversations and we will continue them. And we will with Global Citizen Circle and with others in your own circles. Um, we will be sending everybody a copy of the recording of this uh, program, as well as the many chat questions and comments that have come in. And, the, and I want to thank Phoebe, our Deputy Director of Global Citizen Circle, for putting so many wonderful resources that were mentioned in the chat. Um, lastly, I would like to just, if you're, if you're new to the circle and... Um, and you haven't been here before, I do want to mention that we are a nonprofit. You've seen that Phoebe posted in the chat that we um, we do have to, we're a nonprofit 501c3. We raise funds to do these programs free of charge, and we always have done that. So please, if you're so inclined, um, you can check out the link that Phoebe has put in the chat again. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd be happy to, um, we'd be grateful for anything that you might be able to help us continue doing these circles. So I want to thank everybody once again for being here. Janet, um, so wonderful to have you with us. I, I, I'm so grateful for having met you and have you on our program committee. How, how wonderful is that? Um, Professor Thomas, what a pleasure it was to meet you. And I'm, I'm so happy that Janet <laughs> thought to invite you to the circle. And I hope that this won't be the last time you join us for conversations. Um, so thank you all. As we always do, I know people have to leave and please feel free to. We stay on. Um, if you'd like to stay on, continue talking amongst one another, we welcome that. And um, so please have a great day. And um, I, I, I hope that um, we go all go forward with these words of great wisdom and hope that were shared with us today. Thank you. Great to see you, Jasmine. Hi, Professor. Nice to see you as well. Yes, yes, indeed. You have a lovely voice. She never told me about it. Well, I don't think I ever sang for her class. Oh. Jasmine, I'm going to reach out to you about your paper. Uh, the students in the Critical Race Theory Seminar are producing a new podcast we're calling CRT2, Columbia Race Talks, Critical Race Theory. And um, we will be discussing, as one of the podcasts, the issue that was the topic of your paper. Oh, great. And um, we're going to create a website uh, that will be attached to each podcast. And I told them, I told the team that's going to be working on this podcast that there were several students who wrote superb papers last year when we were online. You know, we're back in the building this year. Um, that um, would be really great resources for people who want to delve a little more deeply into some of the issues that we're going to be discussing in the podcasts. Oh, wonderful. I look forward to it. So um, I'll, either I or one of the, the students will be in touch with you. Okay, great.
Okay, great. Great to see you and to meet your mother, whom I would have met at graduation. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. So thank you, Global Citizen Circle, again. <laughs> you made this happen. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and, Angela. And I just have to chime in because this is one of those, a sixth of a degree of separation. Um, uh, Kendall, your, your student, Jasmine, is the daughter of my lifelong friend since high school and uh, we Angela and uh, we were last together with several other people from around the world who are on this call at Jasmine's wedding in uh, France and they're now in Munich I'm now in Switzerland we're we're um, the what's so wonderful about global citizen circle is it really does um, help all of us feel a sense of connectedness during times that can be, feel so highly divided and polarized. And, and so Theo and the whole team at um, BCC, thank you so much for, for making these kinds of gatherings possible for us. Thanks, Nadine. I, I would love, I saw Nadine that you put in the chat earlier that um, you, you wondered if, if we could hear Marguerite sing. And I, I don't want you to put you on the spot, Marguerite, but you have such a lovely voice and we ended this program in song. So I, I would love it if you would um, sing us a, a few lines of something that, that moves you. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> I am putting you on the spot. Yeah. Um... And you can decline if you'd like. No, 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 no. Let, let me think. Um, for this moment. Uh, no complaints and no regrets. I still believe in chasing dreams and placing bets. For well, I have learned that all you give is all you're going to get. So give it all you got. <laughs> Give it all you got, everybody, because this is the moment. Life. This is the moment. <laughs> all right, and here's to point. life. Yeah, this is the break glass moment. Here's to life. Mm. Thank you. One of my favorite songs. And mine, too. Yeah. And mine, too. I heard Shirley Horn sing it at the Kennedy Center in Washington. Oh, wow. Wow. That's a great but, you know, that reminds me, you know, she lived in Paris. And November 30th, Josephine Baker will go in the Pantheon. Finally. Oh, wow. yep, yep, yep. Finally. It, finally. It, she died in 1975. So it's taken the French a long time, but they did the right thing. Yeah, yep, <laughs> absolutely. All right. Well, thank you all. I've enjoyed um, this way to uh, organize my day. I got up looking forward to this, and I'll spend the rest of the day reflecting on the rich conversation we've had. And I look forward to future gatherings. Thank you, bye -bye. Kendall. Have a great day, Kendall. Thank you. Sure, you too. Bye-bye, bye. thank you. While we still have Jasmine here, I think Dr. Um, sorry, Robert Thompson had asked um, what the name of your paper was. Yeah, so my paper was about domestic violence in the COVID pandemic, and it was um, a study looking at the response of the US uh, and France. And so how domestic violence was also another pandemic that came to light during this um, COVID pandemic. That's wonderful. We have a young mentee, Sakshi Chandra from Mumbai, who was working um, directly with domestic violence um, in India that also increased during the pandemic. Um, so thank you for bringing that to our attention. And lovely to meet you, Jasmine, via Angela. <laughs> well, three days ago, the Washington Post did a virtual seminar, which is now on YouTube on domestic violence. Two congresspersons, Dingle, oh, two women, and I, I forgot the names. Did you see it, Nadine? Yeah, it's, it's on the Washington Post. I saved Post. the link for it. I couldn't watch it while it was live, but I saved the link on it. Yeah, I just watched the repeat, you know, the recording this afternoon. It's excellent. 
<laughs> okay, you you've prompted me, uh, Robert, to ask you to sing, if you would, a few lines of a, of something that moves you. Boy, I guess I really did kind of let you know that I was sitting here waiting somebody to ask me to do that. There night. you go. <laughs> Great. Well, I like spirituals. When Israel was in Egypt land, let my people go. Oppressed so hard, they could not stand. Let my people go. Go down the Moses, way down in Egypt land. Tell old Pharaoh, who let my people go. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you, I was waiting, thank you. Yeah. Anytime, anytime, <laughs> thinking, anytime you're nobody here. Nobody here knows it, I don't know these folks, they don't know I can sing, well, man, give them a big hint, big hint. <laughs> there you go, next time we'll probably ask you to sing again. <laughs> that was wonderful. <laughs> this is a wonderful, a wonderful event to have this conversation globally. Uh, it's really very, very helpful. And, um, and uh, you know, I just, you know, people, it, it seems un, uh, it's counterintuitive that such a program would originate in New Hampshire. Uh, we're not really known for our diversity. Uh, when I moved here 35 years ago, I think I made four. Uh, so <laughs> uh, not really, it's not really that bad, but uh, I'm just really grateful for this, to have this opportunity. Well, I'm so, so glad that you're here with us today. And, and I was um, equally glad to hear you this past week um, at the Black New England Conference. Okay. And I got to hear your beautiful voice then as well. Okay, all right, well, thank you. Yeah, Jerry Ann, Black New, Heritage yes. Trail, New Hampshire. If any of you are ever in New Hampshire and in Portsmouth, be sure to take the tour and see the wonderful trail that uh, is a result of really one citizen historian who decided she needed to know the answer to the question, where are the people who look like me in my city? And that was Valerie Cunningham and that began her work just trying to answer that question has developed now into a trail fully developed in Portsmouth and that will be a, a trail of black marking significant African history in the state of New Hampshire. That's just because Valerie kept asking that question. Mm. Absolutely. The power of a single, of a single, a single citizen to make a difference. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Well, anybody I'll drive else? careful now, you hear? Yes, yes. <laughs> Anybody have anything else you'd like to share or say? If not, we'll, we'll uh, end the meeting, but I, I, I'm so happy that you were all with us today and that you stayed on a little longer beyond the, beyond the, uh, pro the formal program. And we look forward to seeing you the next time. Thank okay. you. Okay. Great, so you're at Meredith. Okay, good, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Just reading the chats, thank you. Thank Before you. we thank go you. to Robert and Nadine Thompson, this is Nadine and Jerry. You remember we connected in Atlanta? Yes, yes. yes. And, yes. and then you're in Ex Exeter and- <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah, so. I do remember, wow. You've got a great memory, my goodness. <laughs> I'm so as soon as you started singing, I could see like you just the name didn't do it alone, but as soon as you started singing, the whole thing came back. Oh, well, Chaplin at Exeter and everything. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Great. Give thank our you. love to the other Nadine, will, your Nadine. <laughs> I will I will I will do that. Yeah, you Nadines need to stick together. You're all yeah. pretty extraordinary in my eyes. <laughs> Thank you. And, I'll, and I'm sure you will want me to tell my wife that she married very well. I'll be happy to tell her. Absolutely. That. <laughs>
as did I. As, as did, did I you. marry the New Hampshire guy who every day stand up, every day wears his Black Lives Matter t-shirt. <laughs> well, you know, you know <laughs> New Hampshire people, boy, I t New Hampshire folks, you know, you know, that's what it is. This is New York, married New Hampshire. And there you go. <laughs> now living in Swiss, now in Switzerland. Yes. New okay. York, Russian, Jewish, married New England, Irish, Catholic, and blessed in a religious ceremony by an Anglican Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Uh, this sounds like a real American Costa. story. So we're, <laughs> wherever, whatever that is, we, we've got it. <laughs> Great. Great. Okay. Great. Well, everybody have a good day, a good evening, good afternoon, wherever you're, wherever you are and whatever time zone you're in. Thank you.